Hello, everyone. It is my honor to be here today. I am certainly grateful to Reverend Kristen for having the faith in me that I can bring this lesson to you. Hopefully something that I'll, I say today will resonate. I want to remind you that this is about connection and not perfection. Thank God for your amazing team of audiovisual and technical experts who make this happen because I am a digital immigrant, not a digital a uh, native. So I start with my prayer. Lord, fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough. Now, I say that little prayer because I learned in seminary and in Toastmasters that the most important thing a speaker can do is make sure that their beginning and their ending are really close together so that we don't lose anybody, you don't fall asleep, you don't tune in and out, or you don't feel like you're in a hostage-taking situation. I always like to start with something funny just to get you excited and interested in what the rest of the story is going to be. The teacher decided to pay little Johnny's parents a visit. When she knocked, Johnny opened the door. She said, hello, Mr. Morton. Are your mother and father in? He says, no, ma'am. They was in, but they is out now. She says, Mr. Morton, it's they were in, but they are out now. Where is your grammar? He says, she's upstairs taking a nap. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed telling it. But I just wanted to get us started, give you something to chuckle about and make you want to hear the rest of what I have to say. Today, I want to talk to you about a new thing. I'm sure you've had some opportunities to experience some new things, like a recording of a sermon and not being able to be live in church on a regular basis, having to wear a mask, being concerned about your health and safety, maintaining social distance, not being able to go to the places as often as you like or even at all. This is a new thing that we're experiencing, a new day. I always like to include a couple of stories to illustrate the lesson. And this story that I've chosen from the Old Testament, from the book of 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, the first through the seventh verse, is about the widow and the jar of oil. You may have heard this story before. I'll read it to you. Now the wife of the son of the men who tell what will happen in the future cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that your servant honored the Lord, but the man to whom he owed money has come to take my two children to make them serve him in order to repay my husband's debt. Elisha said to her, What can I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? To which she said, I have nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go around and get jars from all of your neighbors. Get empty jars, many of them. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the oil into the empty jars. And then as you fill each jar, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They took the jars to her and she poured. When the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another jar. And he said to her, There is not one jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go and sell the oil and pay what you owe. You and your sons can live on the rest. So how does this relate to this story that I started off with from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah representing spiritual understanding? Well, the story has to do with a spiritual aspect of our trust, our faith, our understanding, and our imagination. In this story, the man of God, Elijah, or Elisha, is a king. And according to Charles Fillmore in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, Elisha represents the I am, the spiritual I am, our spiritual understanding, much like Isaiah. The widow in the story represents one who has lost sight of God as support and supply. The vessels or the jars represent our capacity to comprehend perfection through thoughts of love, our ability to measure life, love, and truth. And the oil represents thought of love poured onto everything, making it holy or a perfect whole, the fulfillment of the law. And if you remember stories from the New Testament, you probably remember Jesus telling the disciples, love one another as I have loved you. And you may remember Jesus having to convince others that he did not come 
to overtake, to destroy the laws and the prophets of old, but to fulfill them with one law, and that law being the commandment that we love one another. Love your neighbors as yourselves. That's the true commandment. So in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, we read all of these definitions. We find out where the word or name originated from, what the literal context is, and then the beyond the, the physical context, the practical meaning and how it relates to us. Charles Fillmore also wrote a book called The Twelve Powers of Man. And each power rep represents a faculty in our own mind and also correlates to a part of our body and a disciple one of the twelve. In this case, I'm talking about the power of imagination. The power of, Im of imagination is represented by the disciple Nathaniel. And the power of imagination is located in the third eye. That's the space between your eyebrows above the bridge of your nose. That's the space where me your mental capacity to image things is found. Many wisdom traditions recognize this power of imagination in the third eye. In the Hindu culture, you may have seen people wearing a dot in the middle of their forehead, or it might be a jewel representing the third eye. In yoga, it's the third eye chakra, the ability to imagine what we want to achieve. We also find in the Egyptian culture some 6,000 years ago, the eye of Ra, Ra meaning the sun. And the Egyptians believe that God is the sun, that God is light. You find that symbol on the dollar bill with the pyramid and the single eye in the middle, representing the one all-seeing eye of God, the omnipresence of God. So what is this power of imagination that I'm speaking about? It's our spiritual vision. And it's the most powerful of the 12 powers that Charles Fillmore identifies in people. We use our imagination constantly, sometimes for good, and sometimes, even subconsciously, we are collecting ideas and mental images that we may not be aware of that impress themselves on our subconscious. Sometimes we create things in our thoughts that we don't necessarily want in our lives because we don't pay attention to our imagination faculty, which is very powerful. We say in unity, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. In other words, whatever you imagine in your mind, you can achieve. So how does this power of imagination work? Our most repeated thoughts tend to come true. Repeated thoughts affect the subconscious mind, and the subconscious controls our habits, our desires, our actions, and our reactions. Thoughts attract corresponding circumstances. Thoughts are things, and the thinking process is a creative process. This is how we co-create with God. In unity, we believe in the principle that we are co-creators with God and that we create our own reality through the thoughts we think and the beliefs we hold on to. I have a couple of personal stories I'd like to share about this power of imagination when you use it in the right way, intentionally. When I was 29, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. I had only heard the C word a couple of times in my life. Most of the time, as people I the two times I knew were elderly people who, were, who I didn't know, and I heard about it. I had no idea what that really was until I experienced it. Now, mine was stage one, so I had surgery, and I didn't have to have chemotherapy or any other treatment. But what I did have is a change of mind, a change of heart from that experience. I began to examine myself and my life, to look back over my life, and think about the things that I had accomplished, the people who had helped me, and the things that I had left undone that I still wanted to do. One of those things was to complete my college education. I had taken a few courses here and there, but that's about it. I had a full-time job, a husband in the military, and we had two small children. We didn't have a lot of extra money, so this wasn't really a good time financially to consider going back to school. But I was more determined than ever and my imagination went to work. I created this idea in my mind of me graduating with honors. I saw myself pictured in full color in a cap and gown with gold honor cords and a gold stole that said Phi Theta Kappa. 
I enrolled without any idea of how I would pay tuition. And I was told that I could show up for class and they would call the roll from the computer and ask any names they didn't call to say them out loud. And after two weeks, if I wasn't in the system, I would be dropped. But I kept my faith intact. I had been in unity a few years by then. And I had understood this power, this faculty of imagination and faith. So I approached my boss about approving me for the tuition assistance program. He agreed he would sign the document for me, the application, but assured me that I had put down for 12 hours that that program was designed to only pay for three credit hours, one class. But I was in an accelerated program with a local community college for adults. Uh, it was a program to, for working adults to get their education quicker and, of course, considering some of your work history as well, your work accomplishments and your life accomplishments. So I already had this vision in my head. I got to class and that next day, of course I didn't have tuition, but the next day I got a call from personnel that they had my paperwork ready. To my surprise, they had, they had approved all 12 hours plus money for books and mileage. My supervisor couldn't believe it. He wanted me to take the paperwork back and let them know there had been a mistake. He said they were going to take that out of my paycheck, but that never happened. I enrolled in school and two and a half years later, I walked across that stage looking just like the mental picture I had imagined two and a half years before. Before I ever took the first step to enroll in school, I already knew what the outcome would be because of the power of my imagination. I figured if I did it one time, I could do it again. So I enrolled in the university to get a bachelor's degree. Of course, I forgot to mention, when I graduated from the junior college, I graduated cum laude. And so two years later, I graduated from the university with a bachelor's degree. And I had already painted a picture in my mind of what I would look like before I ever took the first class at that university. And sure enough, I graduated magna cum laude. So I thought, third time's a charm. I enrolled in a master's degree program. And in 18 months, I walked across that stage looking exactly like I thought I would look when it was in my imagination. I graduated with honors, summa cum laude, with my master's degree. Now, I'm not telling you this to brag or to make you think I'm someone special. I'm not a genius. I'm no smarter than the next person. But when you have determination, faith, and imagination, just like the woman with the jar of oil, anything is possible. The same thing happened again when I set my sights on becoming a unity minister. I'd been in unity for a long time, starting at the age of 21. And I would sit in the congregation and hang on every word. And I would think about some of the things in my life that were challenges, that I could turn my mess into a message, my test into a testimony, that I could be the light that I wanted to see in the world and help people. I've always wanted to do that. But working a full-time job, with children and a military family was difficult to achieve that dream. I would take a week out of my vacation every year and study at Unity Village. Little did I know this imagination I had in my mind to become a minister was also being imagined by my minister, Duke Tufty. He had already seen me as a minister sharing that platform with him someday, and I had no idea. Same is true for Reverend Pat Williamson, who also was our associate minister at the time, who told me he had that vision years later, after I'd completed my goal. Lo and behold, many of my credits expired before I'd even gotten close enough to consider being accepted on the ordination path. And then Unity Urban Ministerial School started the online program a few years before I decided to retire. In 2008, I was the first student enrolled in that program. And in 2012, Two months after I retired from a 42-year federal career, I graduated from Unity Urban Ministerial School, and then 2013 I was ordained by Unity Worldwide Ministries. Today I'm the Executive Director of Unity Urban Ministerial School, and I stand on the platform most Sundays when we're not social distancing, not on lockdown, with my mentor, Reverend Duke Tufty, who had faith in me and an imagination that I would someday be his cohort in ministry, and I am truly grateful for that. You see, when you have the power of imagination and you know how to use that faculty, nothing can be impossible. Nothing. If that is yours to do, you will do it. Henry David Thoreau talked about this power of imagination in these words. He said, There is a thinking stuff from which all things are made, 
and which in its original state permeates, penetrates, and fills the inner spaces of the universe. A thought produces the thing that is imagined by the thought. We can form things by our thoughts, and by impressing our thoughts upon formless substance, cause the thing we think about to be created. What is he saying? A new thing can be created out of your imagination. What you think about, you bring about. We know of some amazing people in history who've used the powers of their imagination to do some outlandishly astounding things, like Walt Disney. I'm sure you've heard that name before. You probably heard about the little mouse that he befriended and named Mickey. That was a start of a wonderful and amazing venture. Later on, it became Disneyland and Disney World. And it's just amazing how this man, who was a cartoonist for the Kansas City Star newspaper, evolved from a simple dream into a reality that has touched millions and millions of lives for years and years. He called himself an Imagineer. Imagine that. There are others who have used this power of imagination to achieve their dreams. People like Oprah Winfrey and Denzel Washington. I heard a story about Denzel Washington. He was sharing about how he became an actor. His mother had a beauty shop and he was there one day and many of the patrons had known, her, known him since he was a little boy. And there was a woman under the dryer and she says, come quick, somebody give me a pencil and paper. Now at the time Denzel was going through medical school and he was failing badly. In fact, he was dropping out, and he did not un know what his future was going to be like, and he didn't want to waste any more of his parents' money, and he was really kind of distraught, as young people are when they can't find their way, and they're still young and immature. He couldn't figure out what he wanted to do. This woman scribbled down on a piece of paper, you will speak before millions. Denzel Washington kept that piece of paper, and he pulled it out every now and then. Someone encouraged him to enroll in acting classes. And the rest, as you know, is history, all because of imagination. Imagination forms a mental image of something that is not perceived through our five senses. And because it's imagination, some people will say, oh, you don't, you don't believe in such things. There's no such thing as that. Trust me, from my own experience and others and the woman with the jar of oil, imagination is powerful. According to Psychology Today, it is a natural tendency for human beings to resist change. Opening our minds to a new thing or a new way of thinking can seem scary because it's unfamiliar. I was watching one of the sermons by Reverend Kristen, Kristen recently, and one of the members said that she didn't want to attend a class or talk about racism or, or systemic racism or any of those things. She was tired of hearing about it. Reverend Kristen talked, shared a story of Joshua and the whale, and she talked about his resistance to change and how you know, he was even spit out of the whale and thrown overboard from a boat. All kinds of things happened because he was resisting that spirit of God in him that was calling to him. And he made such a crooked path to get there, but eventually he ended up where he was supposed to be. This particular congregant also went ahead with it, stepped out on faith and continued, even though it was uncomfortable and she was grateful that she continued to study and to learn and to stick with it, even though what she was hearing didn't make her feel comfortable at all. Sometimes testing ourselves to move beyond our comfort zones is the best way to get that imagination going, those creative juices flowing. So this Psychology Today article says, according to studies, there are proven reasons that trying new things makes life better. It says, trying something new strengthens your courage and opens the door to new opportunities. Trying something new keeps you from being bored. Trying something new forces you to grow. Trying something new challenges old beliefs and old paradigms. Alex Blackwell, another writer, says, if you keep doing things the same way you've always done them, you will easily fall into a rut. Perhaps that's some of what's going on right now during this COVID pandemic, when every day seems like Groundhog's Day, we wake up to the same routine, the same old, same old, and some of us may feel like we're in a rut. It may take a little extra effort and your imagination, but you can get out of that rut. Alex Blackwell says, satisfying your thirst for something different reaps great rewards. 
It increases self-confidence. You might surprise yourself when you realize the potential that you've had all along. That's what happened to me when I finished that education and became a unity minister. It helps you appreciate yourself more. A new look, a new hobby, a new motto, learning to use technology will help you appreciate what you're made of. And you're made of good stuff. It helps you to break out of a rut. Don't be afraid of failing. With practice and persistence, you will succeed. You will gain a new skill, a new hobby to add to your repertoire. He says, trying new things helps you see the value all around you. Sometimes we just need a little bit of perspective to appreciate what we already have. Time with family, friendships, getting to know new people. Speaking of which, one of my neighbors decided to try something really new. She stepped out on faith and way out of her comfort zone and rang my doorbell one day. We'd never met. I don't believe we'd ever seen each other. But she knew something about us. She knew that we were the black family living on the corner. She's the white family living around the horseshoe. She had been praying about what should she do, what is hers to do with all of the tension in our society, the protest marches all over the world shortly after the killing of George Floyd. She wanted to know what could she do to make a difference. And through spirit, she heard a voice telling her to go meet your neighbor around the corner, take some cookies and make a friend. She brought a plate of cookies and when I opened the door, she was kind of nervous about what my reaction might be. Would I think that she was some kind of salesperson going door to door trying to convince me to buy something that I didn't want? Or maybe someone trying to convert my religious beliefs? She was apprehensive, but she did it anyway. She was so surprised at what she said she saw was this big smile on my face and a welcoming gesture. She handed me the plate of cookies and she told me that her name is Jane and she said she lives around the corner and she'd love to walk sometime if I would like to. Well, I'd been living on Someday Isle. Someday I'll get out and get some exercise. Someday I'll walk some of these beautiful walking trails that are in my neighborhood. But I was not doing it and it was getting crowded on Someday Isle. So Jane came, came around the right, the perfect time for me and she offered me the opportunity to be a walking buddy. When I brought the cookies in the house and opened the Ziploc bag, there was a note on top of it. And in that she said, she explained why she had gotten this idea through spirit, through prayer, and through meditation, to meet a new friend, a neighbor. And she called herself Kitchens for Kindness. And she quoted 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind. She did not know that she was ringing the bell of a neighbor who happens to be a minister. She didn't know that she was ringing the bell of a neighbor who has been someday aisling about meeting her neighbors too. And she came at the right time. Jane and I have been walking buddies. We walk almost every day. She has shown me places right around my neighborhood that I've, I never would have noticed. And we have an amazing time. Sometimes we walk four miles and by the time we get back home, I feel as if we've just started. We talk the whole time. I'm never out of breath. And it's all, I always learn something new. Jane says the same thing. We keep in touch through text when we're not walking. And she's even come over to my house and played bingo with my 100-year-old mother, whom she adores. After meeting me, she got to meet the family. So with, you know, Oprah says that we create the highest and grandest vision for our life because we become what we believe. Now here is a guru, a master of becoming what you believe. Henry David Thoreau said, the world is but a canvas to the imagination. What kind of pictures are you painting? Perhaps you need to wipe your canvas clean and start over and let your imagination do the work. Lauren Bacall says, imagination is the highest kite that you can fly. Maya Angelou said, this is a wonderful day. I've never seen this one before. She's saying it's a new thing. If we would just open our eyes to see it, the whole world would take on a whole different perspective. It's all about the mind first. We can create the world that we want, a world that works for all. Jesus said it this way, whatsoever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. In her book, The Game of Life and How to Play It, Florence Scoville Shin wrote, the game of life is a game of boomerangs. Our thoughts, deeds, and words return to us sooner or later with astounding accuracy. What you think about, 
you bring about. And as we say in unity, thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. My friend, Reverend Wendy Craig Purcell, has published a book based on her gratitude list that she'd been keeping for years in a journal. The book is called Just For Today. You can get it from Unity. Just for today, she writes, I recognize and celebrate the changes in my life. Consciously chosen or not, they are doorways into something new and good. Recently, I spoke at Unity of Vancouver, British Columbia, and one of the musicians wrote a song to compliment my talk. My talk was titled, Let Your Light Shine. And I love that song so much that I thought I wrote down some of the words that really captured me. They fit perfectly into this lesson today. Tom Arnson writes, I cannot do all the good that the world needs, but the world needs all the good that I can do. What's that saying? There is a new thing that you can do. And doing a new thing, you can be a catalyst for change in this world. During this pandemic, we are experiencing many new things. As I mentioned before, we're social distancing. We're trying to be safe. We're trying to make sure everyone around us is safe. We're wearing masks. We're not going to the usual places that we used to go to, even church on a regular basis. We don't get to hug and kiss our loved ones like we used to. How well we adapt is all about attitude. You can look at it as the most terrible thing that could ever happen in your life, or you can look for the newness in this experience. We may long for things to be back the way they used to be, the good old days, like six months ago. We can go kicking and screaming and complaining every single day that we repeat the same thing over and over. Or we can change our attitudes and see the good in every opportunity. In the words of Maya Angelou again, she said, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude about it. Attitude is everything, especially when it comes to imagination. Changing one's attitude about something new that you don't like or agree with can make the difference between whether your life is heaven or whether your life is hell. We create our own experiences by the thoughts we hold on to. As someone has said, it's better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. Look for a new thing. Unity's second principle, as I said before, is we are co-creators with God. And in that process, through the power of imagination, we can reinvent ourselves and our world, thought by thought. There have been many songs written about this power. The Beatles wrote, Imagine. Imagine all the people living life as one. Gladys Knight and the Pips sang, I've got to use my imagination to think of good reasons to keep on keeping on. I've got to make the best of a bad situation. Well, she's saying, let's look for a new thing. Poems have been written about it, like my favorite by William Arthur Ward. If you can imagine it, you can achieve it. If you can dream it, you can become it. And Unity Minister Eric Butterworth wrote a slogan that relates to this power of imagination. Conceive it and believe it and you will achieve it. C plus B equals A. By changing our attitude, we can see a way out of the wilderness and streams in the desert. We have the power to turn something seemingly impossible and totally uncomfortable like this pandemic to something unbelievably good. We can imagine what we want and bring it into existence, just like the story in 2 Kings and the widow and the jar of oil. What you think about, you bring about. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I invite you to take this idea into your consciousness as we begin our journey into meditation. It's amazing that when I recorded this message, the daily word for the day is renew. My renewal brightens my world. It never ceases to amaze me that when I put my imagination to work, all kinds of ideas start coming to me, songs, and even daily words. This, was, this one is a perfect conclusion for this lesson. Taking time to rest and recharge is an essential part of my spiritual practice. 
I may believe it would take a week-long vacation for me to feel well-rested, or that I would need to redecorate my home in order to feel a sense of newness in my surroundings. When I choose to view my world through the eyes of the Christ presence within me, everything is changed just as it is. This daily word hits the nail on the head. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Join me as we take this idea and the power of our imagination into meditation. Namaste. Mm-hmm.